All right, so I'll start. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Abhishek Jain, and I'm pleased to invite you all to the first episode of the MIM series or the Masters in Management series by Planty. Towards the end of this session, we will also be ha having a Q&A session for which I would request you all to put your questions in the live chat box. Today, we are very fortunate to have with us Samiksha Agarwal, a graduate of the 2017 batch of SRCC or Sri Ram College of Commerce, who then went on to pursue her Master's in Strategy and International Management from the University of St. Gallen in 2020. She is currently working as a senior analyst at 314 Capital. In today's session, Samiksha will be speaking in detail on the application process to the University of St. Gallen, as well as the opportunities that are available both during and after completing a Master's in Strategy and International Management from the University of St. Gallen. I would now like to hand it over to Samiksha to begin this session. Thank you so much, Abhishek. Hello, everybody. So I just graduated and I had my online graduation ceremony uh, last year, I think end of last year. So pretty new graduate, I would say. And I've thought, like I'm, I'm working right now with uh, 314 Capital as a senior analyst. So what we essentially do is basically invest in startups and we are a VC fund. So quite an interesting and a very different uh, job role from what I expected when I was doing my master's. And I think let's just get on to the questions so that I can give you as much of information as possible. And you guys can look me up on LinkedIn, show no worries on that. And you can connect with me as well with any questions that you guys have. Um, I think Abhishek had a set of questions that I wanted to, that, that he wanted me to cover in the uh, session. So I'm going to uh, start right uh, from it and then we can take it forward with a Q&A session, right? This is what has been planned. Yeah, perfect. Um, so the first question that these guys had was, uh, who should be applying? So I think this is a very uh, personal question Like anybody and anyone can uh, apply for this program. It's not that you need to be uh, like, uh, you know, ha having a certain amount of work experience to be applying for this program. But I am sure like in my year at least we had this uh, like credits, minimum credit requirements from like a business background. So it would be better to check that beforehand. Um, like before applying to the program and in my cohort I had people who had work experience of two to three years as well but majorly they were fresh, fresh graduates like in my class so we were a class of 55 people so I would say around uh, three fourth of them were fresh graduates and one fourth had some prior work experience so there is like a very mix of uh, profiles when it comes to who all applies and who gets it. So we had two people from the science background as well, I remember, and apart from that, everybody was from the business background. So I would just suggest you guys to maybe look at the criteria and the requirements at the, like on the university website and drop them clarification emails if you don't cover those minimum credit requirements. And just, you know, like um, clarify that out before applying to any program because you don't want to reduce the chances of getting accepted, right? So, um, like I personally, I went for my, for my master's right after my undergrad because I thought that, like, firstly, I wanted to work uh, outside of India. So, I took the plunge and I was like, okay, let's go for a master's. And this was pretty reputed outside and in India as well. So, I thought this would be a pretty good bet. So, I went right after my master after my undergrad. But there are a lot of people who go for this program even like after working for two, three years. And uh, they basically look for either a career switch or they want to um, like target certain industries, such as consulting, IB, or BC for that matter in Europe. So it depends, like what is your end goal? If you have clarification on that and if you're set on that, and uh, you should research about what like the alumni is doing right now. So if you find people say you want to work in the PE uh, industry, and if you find that okay, there are a lot of alumni working in the PE uh, space, then this is a good program for you, right? Because you get the opportunity to uh, interact with them, network with them, and build a strong uh, like case for your uh, application when applying to PEs in Europe. In Europe, but if you find that okay, not many alumni, alumni members are working for the PE or pointing PE fund, then this is not a good opportunity for you. So it depends what your end goal is. And for me, I wanted to do something like on the front of uh, acquisitions plus advisory. And this this program was perfect for me because I could choose many integrators in m and And um, our program is essentially made for consulting people, right? So this was a perfect fit for me in that respect. 
and uh, so I so I applied for the program, and yeah, I, I was fortunate fortunate enough to get through it, and it's been a it's been quite a good experience uh, for sure. So going going on to the next question, when to apply? Um, I think it's always better to apply as early as possible, right? So I made a very big mistake. Like I applied, I, I, I applied in the third round, and uh, I think I'm a perfectionist perfectionist when it comes to like doing applications. So I took a lot of time with my essay. I applied at the like on on the last day of the third round, and I think like more than the chances of getting accepted, the anxiety kind of you know makes you like it it, it kind kind of increases the pressure on you and then you're like why did you plan it better so i would suggest obviously it's better to uh, apply in the first or the second round but my admissions council they told us that it doesn't really matter which round you apply for because every round has specific number of seats allocated this was the case for my year so i think depending upon when you give your gmat and how before how can you plan it ahead of time would be a good uh, starting point and start with your gmat uh, gmat uh, examination and then go on to see the deadlines for the various universities and apply as early as possible but i think this is a common myth that if you apply in the third or the fourth round you won't get accepted i was setting example i got accepted but obviously your chances are really like it, it gets slim slim up because if say a particular nationality has been represented in the first two rounds then in the third round you getting accepted would be like uh, like the chances of you getting accepted would be low right so it's better to apply early and plan early for your gmat as well like i have heard a lot of people giving gmat twice or thrice so if you want that window to be open please apply like please plan ahead of time because i sat for my gmat in december and then i applied for this program in february or march i guess because i got my results and then i did my application process and by then i had missed the second deadline so yeah this is about when to apply then about how to apply i think i shouldn't be school feeding you guys how to apply it's quite easy right just go on to the website check the requirements check the application process uh, as i mentioned before plan ahead of time so that you guys um, are prepared for what is uh, you know what the deadlines are and what all you need to submit so it's a pretty straightforward process you go to the website check the check the requirements give your gmat um plan your essay really well because it can be like make it or a break or make it or a break it kind of situation your essay then you have a video interview so kind of you know maybe read about what's happening in your or read about what's happening in india so this is how you can plan ahead of time and you know this is how you can apply it. quite straight forward right so not a big deal no uh, like there's no um, really tech technicalities involved in terms of you know how can you apply for this institution then your experience regarding the application process i think i'll take it step one step at a time so uh, you need your gmat score as i mentioned before you guys need your uh, transcripts from the university you need your uh, like your certificates of all the extra curricular activities Uh, positions and responsibilities that you have had. You need your SOPs from like your uh, professors back in college, and uh, post that, like this is basically all that you need to apply for the program. And then you have the essay requirement, which they say covers ten percent of the entire application process. But I got a feedback after my uh, like my acceptance that my essay was the uh, one sole thing that. Uh, gave me the admission to the masters program because they really liked it and nobody made the essay their uh, motivation letter so what happens at st gallen is that you get an abstract topic like for my year i got the topic how disruption is shaping the world and i do i do write on it like that i'm for it or against it and i do basically dp out okay if i think that your disruption is good for the world then how is it the case and if it's not then obviously the other way out So I took a lot of time to actually plan out my essays. I remember I had like around twenty to twenty-five drafts of my essay because I wanted to make it perfect, and I took a very different stance for it. Like uh, I spoke about everything, like starting. Uh, I'm actually a very big science fiction fan, so I um, like I spoke about different scientists, like how what what Stephen Hawking thought about the world and how he changed his views, and that. Change of view in itself was disruptive for himself and and for the world as well, right? So I went deep into those things, and then I even like uh, tried to understand. Okay, like when it comes to uh, like people say that yeah, 
you are being pulled to the earth right because of the force of gravity that's not the case like the mass around the earth pushes you down right so i spoke about those technical things as well and how disruption is like that mass acting and you know how it's causing changes in the world so i spoke about um, charles darwin i spoke about uh, wc uh, dotchen and you know people like him people like them and then i made it like a motivation letter say, saying how the programs or the courses in sim like uh, strategy and international management would be helping me to cause disruption in the world firstly and secondly what are my plans in the future and how i plan to create a, a positive impact on the world so i think just having those uh, like had a very structured knowing what to communicate in the essay and putting down the pointers first and then filling up the pointers was a good good way to start with it so yeah like essay is one of the Uh, one of the parts of the application process, and then the last part is the video interview, and that's around thirty percent weightage they say. But then they don't really look for like the right answer. You know, they're looking for people who are confident enough to speak out their mind, who are quick to address what problem is put in front of them, and um, who don't really get panic panicky when it comes to any question that they don't know about. So I'll just give you certain examples. They, there were there were a few guesstimates on okay how many uh, medals do you think could Switzerland win in the Winter Olympics? So I don't do a guesstimate on that. They basically give you like a thirty minute window to think about it, and then the recording starts. So you have to speak and speak for like two minutes or something, as much as I remember. So that is about the video interview. They're not looking for the correct answer at all. So don't get very surprised. Like you know, I don't know the answer about how should I address this particular question. Then, like they not, they don't want. Okay, if it's A, it should be A. You can be like, okay, C, C, D, E, and then you will come up to A. That's not a problem. They're looking for two, three things majorly. Firstly, your confidence. Secondly, how you structure the answer. Thirdly, if you don't know about the answer, how do you give them background information around what you know? Right? Because there were there are a few questions that are general awareness questions as well. And uh, even certain questions which ask for your viewpoint. So, what's your viewpoint on war on drugs? Something as simple as that. But not many people know about war on drugs and how it went around, uh, went along in the US, right? So, like reading about these abstract topics will also help you. So, it's all about like reading up a bit, being very confident about your answers, and being structured. This is what they're looking for. So not a big deal at all. Like very chill. Enjoy the application process. I would say like this is what I did. Although I was very anxious, I, I was applying for the third round. So yeah, like um, I would suggest you guys should just uh, be very confident firstly, and just plan everything properly. Like don't go haywire. It's gonna be totally fine. And you can just connect with me in case you guys need any help uh, with respect to the application process. And yeah, there's one more thing actually. So there are certain clubs called GMAT clubs and all, right? So I went through those clubs. Those are not that useful, but then they might help you with certain sample questions as well. So please take a look at those clubs. And secondly, they give like uh, Saint Gallen in itself. They provide you these um, like sample case cases or sample questions that you can prepare. So what I did was before sitting for the actual interview, I actually. Did that quite often, so that I become comfortable with that. You know, thirty minute question, thirty minute time to think, and then speaking for two minutes. So I think practice would make you really uh, like comfortable in that situation. So yeah, this is about the application process and what all you should keep in mind while applying for it. Uh, say Galen, like specifically, Sim. I would say I don't know about the other programs. So yeah, going on to the next question, they want to talk. Like they want me to talk about uh, insights about pursuing uh, STEM in uh, Saint Gallen, right? So regarding insights, I think why did I choose STEM? I can maybe answer that question, and uh, that would help you guys to understand. Okay, like uh, what all can you get out of STEM for that matter? So firstly, I would say, like for me, uh, the most important thing was definitely the class size, class size, because we are only fifty five people in sim. Uh, if you compare it to other uh, masters in management programs, it's around like hundred hundred fifty people, right? So I wanted a small class class size because which which actually like kind of uh, gives you more leeway for having conversations with the professor with your peers, right? So I wanted this uh, back and forth communication kind of a setting. So sim fit in uh, that checkbox really well. Then secondly, I saw the alumni network, and they they would all of them are doing pretty good stuff, and these guys are super connected. 
So I wanted like a community feeling instead of you know having like hundreds or thousands of alumni and not really connected to them. So seventh grade really well in that as well. Then thirdly, in terms of my um, like my education, like my tuition fees and all as well, I like everybody looks for an ROI at the end of the day, right? So for me, SIM was uh, my first priority because of that also, because it's basically uh, subsidized by the government of Switzerland. So you pay around, I think, three thousand three hundred francs or something for one semester. So which is around two lakh something INR, right, for one semester, which is which is very low when compared to other university compared to other universities. So this was the third point. Fourthly, definitely we look for reputation, right? I wouldn't say rank as such, but reputation. And SIM has been um, really highly, uh, like, well, like I would say, sought out program throughout Europe. And uh, I thought that this would be a good enough start if I want to make a career in Europe. Like, this program is the best one because everybody knows about it. Em- employers are looking for people who graduate from uh, SIM. So yeah, this was the fourth point. And then uh, the next point was about, you know, how will they support me to get a job opportunity in uh, Europe, which I figured is not prevalent in almost all the European universities. Because uh, like if you compare India with Europe, in India you have placement cells and you have you know campus placements and all, but in Europe that's not the case. Because you have to do your own networking, you have various sessions that you can go to, you have to build your own network and kind of land an interview and then land a job. So yeah, like these were a few points and uh, as I mentioned, how SIM fit perfectly well for me. And it could be the case for somebody like you guys as well, in case you guys are listening to this conversation. Um, now, regarding the next question, opportunity, opportunities and skills acquired upon completion of master's in strategy and international management degree. Yeah, so this is, pretty, this is a pretty good question. So I would start with the opportunities part. In opportunities, we definitely had like a lot of these career sessions, banking days, consulting days, where companies used to come up and used to give like uh, different uh, like workshops, sessions, and even like uh, certain case study competitions. So in terms of opportunities, we had a lot of these networking events. And from day one itself, I guess you had uh, companies coming up, you had, you know, like your, uh, we have a career counselor at SIM as well. So she basically sits with you in the beginning of the program. She kind of understands, okay, what is your aim through the program? What do you want to do? What what areas are you interested in? What areas do you want to explore? And she formulates a plan along with you for, for you. It was like a pretty good thing. And I found it really nice because it was very personal. And right now is when I'm uh, connected with my career counselor. And she keeps on telling me, okay, what's happening in the European market? And, you know, when will things open up? Because of COVID, everything is pretty slow right now in Europe. Europe as well. So yeah, like in terms of opportunities, there are a lot of uh, lot of areas that you can work around. And I'll be speaking briefly later on on uh, how can you be prepared, better prepared for SIM. Because a lot of the things that I learned throughout the program, if somebody would have come and told me before, I would have been better at it. So that I'll come down later on. In terms of skills acquired upon completion, I would say that uh, the most important skill that I acquired would be my confidence in putting forward my ideas. So I was basically interning with Ernst & Young in M&A Advisory in Zurich. So everybody was pretty new for me, right? And they were quite late, like, like quite senior as well. But I wasn't hesitant on putting forward my ideas. And these guys, they were pretty impressed with the quality and the quality of both my like presentation and the content that I was putting forward. So I think everything that I could... Uh, I give to my internship was because of SIM and SRCC for sure. So I think, yeah, a lot of confidence I gained firstly. Then secondly, uh, I knew how to adapt to German people. I knew how to adapt to Italians because everybody works differently and there are a lot of cultural differences. Trust me on this. Because people in Spain, they're very lazy, but at the same time, they're super like, maybe, you know, like you'll be very comfortable when you talk to them. But Germans, at the same time, they're very structured, very, you know, work-driven and not talking about anything else. And Italians have both the attributes in them. So kind of understanding how different cultures function was a very uh, very good skill that I gained. And I think that was because there were not many Indians in that program as well. Because only 55 people, right? So 20 nationalities were represented in my year. So you could imagine, like, uh, there were a few people from a lot of nationalities. So it was a good thing, I guess. Then thirdly, I was very much like I, I'm really good at teamwork and team-based activities because that is what we essentially did throughout our program. 
like there was a time when um, like, I think I had around fifteen to twenty groups on WhatsApp because of that sole reason because you're just doing team based work and it helps you because firstly you understand okay how can you react to people putting their uh, concerns forward and secondly how can you maybe aid in the entire process of you know coming up with the output at the end because a lot of the times what happens in these team activities is that you digress a lot and then you forget okay what were we actually doing right so those are the kind of skills that you gain out of um, doing team based activities then fourthly i would say um everything was very practical oriented right and so because our professors were also uh, board members in different companies so uh, that really gave me the edge of you know doing what happens in reality as well so if you are studying a concept in say strategic management so just knowing how nokia failed at it would be a good enough starting point right to understand okay you know this is how um, this, this is actually apply the concepts and i think that was a great, like like a very good thing for me like uh basically how i landed on my internship at Ernst & Young in Zurich was also because of case study competition and there i spoke about like how a sort like how sort like one emily framework actually worked in real life and i applied it in the case study competition and that that in itself showed them okay this is what we generally do in bag and eva as well how how does this girl know about it so you know like then they called me to the office then i had my interview rounds and then they basically gave me the offer and i was interning with them So I think the fourth point where I talked about practical orientation with all the theories that we had was is, is a very very essential point. Then the fifth skill would be like uh, trying to adapt yourself to um, situations which are unprecedented. So we have something called imagination challenge, and I think that was the best part of the program because and I worked with refugees in Greece for like uh, like it was basically for two semesters, but I went there for two weeks, and I was in a small island. There was some things, and uh, there were a lot of things that we couldn't plan ahead of time, because uh, you know, like the refugees, basically, that uh, you never know. Like there might be hundred of them today, but tomorrow they might just migrate to some other place. So planning ahead of time wasn't really an option for us. So there were so many unprecedented situations happening, like our photographer cancelled at the end moment. We were working for this cookbook along with uh, UNDP, so we couldn't really, uh, you know, get the professional photographer. But I had my DSLR, so I took took up that role. So stuff like that happening, you know. So yeah, tackling unprecedented situations is the fifth point. Then um, I, I think I'm missing out on something. Yeah, like you guys can imagine, like there's so many skills that that you can acquire through sim. So there's there's a never ending list. If I remember something, I'm going to speak in the middle of um, like the Q and A that we have. Um, going on to the next question, busting common myths. I think Abhishek, you should pitch in and you can tell me what are the common myths uh, which are uh, associated with Zim, because um, I, I I don't really like I, I could bust them if you tell me what are the common myths. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep, sure. So, um, I'm going to be very honest. I don't know too many of them myself since I'm not from a management background. Uh, yeah. But I think the one thing that I do have from the top of my head is how exactly do you compare this degree to an MBA? And also, is it is it correct for a student to think that after, let's say, I complete a bachelor's in management or commerce, my first preference has to be an MBA, and all of these, let's say, an MIM or an SIM, are all just let's say secondary options? So basically, um, here it depends upon two things. Huh. Like, uh, if you want to do an MBA in India, then I see. I think a lot of my seniors also told me this. It's better to uh, apply for an MBA right after you uh, like graduate from your undergrad university. And there are two, three points involved in this because, like, MBA in the US and in India is quite distinct, right? In the US, you need four, five years of work experience. In India, that's not the case. So in IIMs and all, once you apply for any uh, placement opportunities, like in your First or the second year, you are treated equally to a person who might have had work experience of two to two to three years, and you apply for the same role. So I think if you do MBA in MBA in India, it makes sense to apply right after your undergrad because there's not much of uh, benefits associated after working for two to three years and getting the same pay as a fresh graduate, right? But when you compare it to an MBA in the US. Definitely, you'd have to work for three, four years. A lot of my peers from SRCC have just got enrolled in uh, HBS, right? So they so they planned their career in that way. They worked in like different consulting companies, then VC firms, startups, and then they made an application to Harvard or Columbia or that matter, right? So yeah, that's about MBAs. About MIM, I would say like I specifically like strategy and international management, 
because it wasn't really BIM as such, because there were a lot of other aspects to it which weren't there in the other programs. And I thought this was a good enough bet for me because uh, firstly, I wanted to like work, like I wanted to work in an institution where I'm not doing the back end work, so where I'm not really, you know, helping people with say putting down certain things in a PPD or something like that. Like I wanted to use my own mind and the uh, companies that were coming up in my college, they were primarily for the first uh, part that I told, right? Uh, like doing the very back end roles. So I, I, that is why I thought that MIM is a good enough uh, start for me. And uh, I went for SIM and I talked to a lot of people who were from non-EU, who were from non-EU countries in SIM. And I had to understand okay, what are the job prospects there because that was my aim, right? So everybody, yeah, this is a myth. So people say that getting like a job in Europe is quite tough, but it's not that tough if you put your mind into it. So with me, what happened, I'll tell you about my story. So um, in my second semester, I basically, I was attending a lot of sessions. It's obviously very difficult in terms of networking and building that, you know, reputation amongst that uh, industry that you are looking for a job being a non-EU person. But like what worked out for me was I uh, went for the case study competition. I was in the winning team. They called me to the office, took my interview, and then they gave me the offer. And then a month after my like a month during my internship, they applied for they, they gave me a full time offer as well. So they were ready to uh, do my work visa as well. And then they applied for my work visa. And that process in itself is very huge. So in Switzerland, what happens is that um, you have to open like that profile that you're opening for the non-EU person for like two months on all the European portals possible, take interviews of people, reject people, and then build a business case for that non-EU candidate. That, okay, I want this candidate because I couldn't find anybody in the EU region. And then you have to put forward, okay, how does the education time work experience help with it? Um, so yeah, they did my application in the month of January, and then by February or March, I was supposed to get my result for it. But um, since COVID happened, uh, the Swiss government rescinded all applications. So they were not accepting applications, and they were like, we won't be reviewing those applications as well. So yeah, it was bad timing for me, but that doesn't mean it's impossible, right? It's still possible. And I interviewed with the German partners as well. They liked me, and then they wanted to give me an offer, but they couldn't, it's just because of COVID. So it's not a very big deal that, you know, uh, you won't be able to get a job. But I would suggest one thing, like from my learnings, I was very much hell-bent on getting a job in Switzerland. It was a bad uh, decision on my end. Like I should have kept the job, job fees open. Like it's easier to get a job in Germany. It's easier to get a job in Netherlands if you do masters from there. So I would suggest people who want to do SIM, they can maybe do a double masters in Netherlands, maybe with Rotterdam or something, and then apply to Netherlands. Because it's way easier to get a visa there. But in Switzerland, it's very tough, people. And if you have that in mind, it's going to be like a, like a lot of hard work, a lot of rejections for that matter. And in London as well, I guess um, there's a new policy the government has taken out, right? You can stay back for two years. So that's a good enough opportunity as well. So I think what you guys should do is maybe not be hell-bent on SIM, but think about, okay, what's your end goal? And if you want to work, say, in a particular, say, in Europe or maybe London for that matter, accordingly talk to people who are non-EU people working in those countries, try to understand from them what worked out for them, and then apply to a program. Just don't apply to SIM because it's the best program in the world. It doesn't really matter, right? It should serve your purpose. So I would say, like, targeting Germany or Netherlands, Luxembourg as well for that matter. Uh, these are good geographies, and London as well, I guess, yeah. That's that's honestly a very very interesting story, and it's it's really really tough luck as to what happened because of COVID. But like I really yeah. hope that you can you can make it back there. Uh, but yeah, that's that's a very that's interesting. That's a very very interesting outlook to that. Um, I think the last myth, or rather I should say, question that I have with respect to um, this point is that most of the time when an Indian student or let's say somebody studying in India is applying for a master's program anywhere outside the India, there's always this presumption that you know I need to do something after my undergrad degree to get some kind of work experience before I go outside, simply because I might not be able to create the best profile for getting selected or shortlisted. So, any comments on that? I think that's not the case. There are two sides to the story, okay? Firstly, you could apply into a master's program, right? So master's is meant for fresh graduates or for people with one to two years of work experience. 
So applying to an MBA is different, but MIM, I guess you don't really need any work experience for that. So building a profile would be from the point of view of having good extracurricular activities, having good positions and responsibilities, you know, having certain initiatives that you might have taken with respect to some community building work that you might have done. So those are the points, like, like you know, these are two different people, right? One person who's a fresh graduate will, will have a totally different profile. And a person who has worked for one to two years will have a totally different profile. So it depends on which stage you are in and how strong can you build the profile accordingly. So there isn't like one correct answer to it. But there's another side to this. So when you apply for your visa, like work visa, uh, if you get a like like an opportunity to work in a company full time in Europe, then having a work experience of one to two years would actually be better. Because what happens is then the government will know that, okay, this guy, this guy or girl, she, he or she doesn't only have the education background, but he, he or she knows something in that industry already. So they can add better. It's just about building the business case stronger. That's it. It's not that it's going to be like a deciding factor, not at all, but it will make your business case stronger. So I would suggest, yeah, work for one to two, one or two years if you are really hell bent on getting a job there. Yep, I think I think that makes sense, and I think that brings me to the end of the myths. So I think I could uh, go ahead with the Q and A session. Yeah, sure. All right. So uh, with the Q and A session, I think uh, one of my questions is also follow up to the myth itself, and that's specifically with respect to again profile building and the resume. So when you apply for any masters outside India, you always need to you you need to really have a strong. TV or a strong profile of sorts. So when you're applying for a SIM, do you think that there's anything in terms of co-curricular or extracurricular activities that a student could or rather should do to present a stronger profile and increase their chances of selection? Yeah, sure. So I would say like uh, you should see from the perspective of what are we looking at, uh, like looking for in a candidate, right? When anybody applies for SIM. So firstly, it's all about how good a team player are you. So how can you show that attribute? You can show that attribute by, uh, you know, like uh, going for case study competitions, winning those competitions along with your team. Uh, then the second thing is you have to be a community contributor. So we have this imagination challenge, right? So if you're working at Enactus in your uh, like university, that could be a good enough point that you talk about in your application. Then thirdly, they're looking for people who are strong in academics. So having your academics right on point, having your GMAT score right on point is a good enough uh, addition to your application, right? And then what else do they look at? Yeah, I think they look at creativity and innovation for that matter. So if you are um, like initiating certain organizations in your uh, in your university, so you can talk about that really well in the essay as well, right? So it's just about connecting all the dots together and about showing them, okay, like this is uh, this is what an ideal sim student looks like, and I can be one of them. And actually, there's no ideal sim student for that matter because everybody's super different, right? But it's just about checking those three requirements that any admission councils have. So yeah. I yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm so sorry. So, um, yeah, I, I think that, that that's a very interesting answer again. And that again brings me to my second question, which I think is again related to the whole um, idea of profile building and actually figuring out which is the right master's for you. So do you think that there's any internship that you would recommend for a student to do during their undergrad in, in a business or a commerce background to better understand that, okay, a sim is what I want to do, or let's say it's an MBA that I want to do, and which is the best fit for me and why? I think uh, that that's a weird question for uh, even the undergrad students and even for me because when I was in SRCC, I remember I didn't like I was exploring a lot of things together. It wasn't that I was hellbent on getting into sim. It wasn't it, like that wasn't uh, the case at all. And I want to be very truthful about it. Like I gave my IPCC, I finished all like the two levels, and then I gave up on CA even though I had the second thing covered, right? And I was like, no, C is not meant for me. And then I sat for my CAT as well. And I remember uh, CAT was happening uh, along with my uh, university examinations. And it didn't go that well for me. I scored, I think, mid-90s mid or something, just, which wasn't good enough. And then I sat for my GMAT. And initially, like, even after doing my GMAT, I was like, okay, I'm going to target LBS or something like that. And then my mind completely changed. I'm like, no, I'm not going to go for those cliche universities. Like, I need to think, okay, what is my aim, firstly? And secondly, research as much as possible. Like, why do you listen to people? Formulate your own opinions, right? So I researched a lot. I came 
uh, like I came across sim and I talked to a few people. I absolutely loved it. I'm like, this is what I wanted to do. And I still remember that I, uh, they, they had this uh, pre-formatted resume for us. Okay. Oh guys, actually there's a pre-formatted resume. Remember that because it was around 12 o'clock in the morning in India and I was supposed to submit my application. And I had a resume which we used in uh, SRCC. Okay. So I thought I'm going to submit that. I like an idiot. I didn't read the uh, fact that they have a pre-formatted resume. So at 12 o'clock in the morning, on the day of the application deadline, I'm sitting, I'm changing my resume. I send it to my counselor. I'm like doing back and forth with him. And then I was like, the time difference here, three and a half, four hours. Ago. So let's just utilize that time difference. And within three hours, I did my resume. And last minute, I pressed the send button. So yeah, this is about being unprepared. So guys, be prepared whenever you do applications. So coming back to the uh, question on, what was the question actually? Uh, so yeah, so my question is specifically about, let's say, types of internships. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I would suggest in terms of internships, like um, I didn't do a lot of internships to be frank, because I wasn't really aware of what I want to do. And a lot of my peers as well, like my friends did one or two internships. Like I did an internship with a startup, I remember, Quick Drop. And my friends basically did uh, cliche internships at like EFI or you know, KPMG and stuff. So yeah, like I would suggest if you can, there's a very good program by McKinsey, I remember, on the, on the community aspect. So doing internships like those would be a, a good uh, addition to your uh, resume. Like BCG also has those kind of internships, especially for the undergrad uh, students. So explore those different options instead of going with the cliche ones. Work for a startup, maybe, you know, get a feeling of how entrepreneurs function. Maybe you get that spark in you and you don't really go for your master's and you open your own company. So it's just about exploring, you know, like don't really think that, okay, I want to go into SIM. So let, let, let me do an um, internship in consulting. Nobody will give you an internship in consulting when you are in your undergrad. So it's just about prioritizing, okay. You know, do I want to explore right now or do I just want to build my resume? I think exploring is a good option and that will help you build your resume because you'll be more interested in what you're doing. Yeah. Yep, yep. I think that answers my question. And I think this is probably my last question with respect to the application sure. process. So uh, could you could you tell us a little bit about the very, very interesting video round, which is also, I'm from what I understand, one of the core bases on which you are actually selected finally. So could you talk a little bit about what exactly happens in that round and how you could best prepare yourself for it? Yeah, sure. So the video round, I don't think it's a, it's, it's a very, like, it's the most important part of the application process. I wouldn't say that because it depends on how you perform across the three things that they want, right? The application which includes the GMAT score, then the uh, video interview and the essay. So for me, they told the essay was the uh, breakthrough, but not the video interview. So it depends on how much thought you put into all the three pieces instead of just focusing on the video interview. And the video interview, to be very frank, is not a big deal, guys. It's really simple. So what happens is they give you, there's a pre-recorded uh, question list. So the first question starts, it's like it continues for like 10 to 15 seconds. And then they give you 30 seconds to think about the question, your answer. And then you speak for like one minute, one and a half minutes, maybe two minutes drops. So questions can vary from opinion based questions to guesstimates to even, you know, your um, what's happening around the world, like um, across geographies for that matter. So how can you best prepare for it would be, I think there are three to four things that you can do. Firstly, start reading about what's happening in Europe. That's a very important uh, thing. You should know, like, during my application process, Brexit was happening. So I read a lot about that. Then secondly, like, practice a few guest statements with your friends. I think uh, for consulting interviews, anyway, we do, the, uh, like, we do this kind of pre preparation in our undergrad university, right? So do it for the college applications as well. And then thirdly, it's all about practice, right? So they give you a, a week's worth of time. Uh, you know, between the time when they send the link and when you have to submit it. So I would suggest take their time, practice as much as possible through the sample questions that they have. Because you have to be comfortable with their timing difference that, that's there, right? And comfortable speaking to a camera as well. And now I guess people are quite comfortable because of COVID, but then also like just practice, right? So uh, yeah, this would be it. And the fourth thing would be uh, talking to people. Like if in case you have found anybody who, have, who, who was admitted in the previous rounds, talk to them, what kind of questions did they have? Because a lot of these times the question mark is similar. So for me, what happened, in, I read a few on the GMAT club 
and I got the same question. Like one question was same. So just that familiarity kind of increases your confidence, right? So yeah, these are the four ways in which you can prepare. Now, what are they looking for through the video interview would be firstly structure in your answers. How do you uh, think in 30 seconds and structure your thoughts and present the thoughts properly? Second, your confidence, even if you don't know about the answer, how are you uh, putting forward your thoughts? Like how are you, maybe even if you're digressing, how are you digressing confidently, you know? Like that would be important. And then the third thing I would say is uh, like not being panicky and not being, you know, I don't know this shit, man, and showing it on your face. Like you should be very composed and, you know, even if you don't know something, don't show it on your face. Because these guys don't know that you don't know about it, right? And the question can be interpreted in a lot of different ways. Since a person is not sitting and communicating with you, it's actually a very plus point because you can interpret the question as and how you want it. To be answered, you know. So yeah, these are the few things I would suggest. Yep, those are some wonderful tips. So thanks for that. And sure. with that, I come to the last question for today's Q and A session. Um, so this is actually with respect to the GMAT exam. So could you talk to us a little bit about when a student should start preparing for this, and also if there was any kind of coaching or any kind of external help that you took for it, and if you found that to be necessary. Sure. So this is a very good question with respect to me as well, because I gave my GMAT at the end, uh, very much end, and I prepared for only 20 days. But I think the CAT prep really helped me because uh, the questions were quite similar. Like for porn, I knew I need to get a 51. There, there was nothing else that I had in mind because I didn't have time to prepare, right? So English takes a lot of time to prepare. So I was like, I'm going to perfect my porn, get a 51 and get a score, which is around 710, 720. So, yeah, like about preparing for GMAT, I think you should give it some time. Like, don't be like me, don't prepare for 20 days and don't be very hasty with it at all. Although, But um, I didn't really, like, like the GMAT coaching was very short-lived, I would say. It wasn't like for a long period of time as such, right? So, uh, yeah, they helped me with my coaching plus my application process. But um, when it comes to, uh, like, coaching for GMAT, I think you should take it. Because if that is what you want to do, why not just put in all your effort, right, and not leave any stone untaught? Because you shouldn't have the guilt in you later on or maybe the stress in you that, you know, Shit, man, I should have just taken the coaching. I could have scored better. So it's just about, you know, what you view is more important for you. If GMAT is the thing for you, take coaching, prepare for it, give two months uh, time to it. And don't be very hasty with it, I would suggest. So, yeah. And like my CAD coaching, I still remember, I did this, I practiced a lot in once for my CAD as well. And I kind of, you know, remembered answers at the end of my preparation phase. So when I was giving my uh, GMAT, the last question that came in quant for GMAT, I already knew the answer because I did it in CAT. So it was so quick for me. That is why I got a 51 in quant. So it's all about practice in GMAT as well. Just practice, practice, practice. And English is, it, it's, it's, a, it's, mo it's more, I would say it's tougher than um, uh, quant when it comes to GMAT. So practice English more and be very dedicated. It can, it can get boring sometimes, but yeah, just, just do it. All right. And yeah, I think that brings us to the end of both the Q&A session and also the session. So uh, thanks. Thanks a lot for joining us, Samisha. And um, I would just like to take this opportunity on behalf of Team Plant to thank you for this wonderful session. And I hope that it is useful for students in the future who watch this video and then apply accordingly. Yeah, sure. And uh, just, just an end note. So uh, in case anybody wants to connect with me and want to know more about STEM or have uh, certain specific questions that uh, the team hasn't covered, you can connect with me over LinkedIn and uh, I'll share my LinkedIn profile with Abhishek as well. You can just, you know, circulate it uh, in, if, if it's needed. And yeah, I'm more than ready to help you guys because uh, it was kind of the same for me when I was applying right, to STEM. So don't worry, it's going to be totally fine. And it's an amazing experience. Like those 55 people are still my family. So they're like super good people. And I remember just one more thing. I think you have to work work very hard. It's okay. Like don't think that you can party and you can uh, 
and you can just clear all the exams. Because in SIM, I still remember first semester we were getting mails from admin saying that guys sleep. We never used to sleep, you know, like four o'clock until morning we are working and then we went for a 7 a.m., 8 a.m. class. So we got a mail from admin saying we don't want, want like McKinsey level uh, analysis of presentations. Guys sleep. Like this was the mail. And they were like none of the SIM batches we had to send across such emails. So yeah, you can imagine like a lot of hard work definitely and people are amazing. Like they have that push in them, you know, that I want to do the best. And that kind of competition actually reinforces you to work harder, right? So I think that, that it's a very good atmosphere and environment to be in. So I would suggest it uh, yeah, like, uh, like for sure, like you guys should be doing it. But just think about what you want to do in life and what geographies you are targeting and accordingly apply. Like, I think that that would be the end advice I would give anybody. And don't be hell-bent on getting a job in Switzerland, guys. It's tough. Yep. Yep. Thanks for that. And yeah, yeah definitely. Sure. We will, we will, I think, uh, if you're okay with it, we can put your LinkedIn profile in the description for the video. And yeah, so thanks. Thanks once again, Samiksha. No, it was sure a wonderful all. session. Thanks so much. Same here. Yeah. All the best to your team.